Hello and welcome. Today I would like to present my work, which I made already one and a half years ago, but I think it is still interesting and maybe inspiring for some of you. In the year 1987, Creative Technology released their first song card under the name Creative Music System. It contained two Philips SAA-1099 integrated circuits, which together provided 12 channels of square wave stereo sound, and four channels of which could be used as noise. A year later, the Creative Music System, or short CMS, was released by Radio Shack as Game Blaster, which name became even more popular. The very same audio option was used by various game consoles and some home computers back then. It started to become popular and was supported by some games made by Sierra Online and such games like The Secret of Monkey Island. However, around the same time another sound card joined the competition, Adlib. This sound card was based on the Yamaha YM3812, also known as OPL2, which provided a much softer FM sound due to its sinus wave instead of the square waves like in CMS. Because of reasons, Adlib found much wider acceptance and the list of supported games grew very fast. Since Adlib didn't bother to patent their sound card, Creative joined the party soon and released their famous Sound Blaster 1.0 in the year 1989. This sound card used the same Yamaha YM3812 FM sound chip as the Adlib card and so was instantly compatible to all the games made for Adlib. Furthermore, Creative integrated a digital signal processor or short DSP, to support digital sound effects and cap the support for CMS as well. Creative just didn't know at that point what will do the run, CMS or OPL2, so they decided to keep both. And actually, CMS had even some advantages over the OPL2, like stereo capabilities, but still the popularity for CMS dropped after a while. So, as Creative released their updated Sound Blaster 1.5 in the year 1990, the Philips SAA 1099 ICs became optional to reduce the costs, but Creative still left the dip sockets on the sound card to give an opportunity to upgrade to CMS, probably in the hope that CMS would celebrate its revival. However, the Sound Blaster 2.0, which was released in the year 1991, was the witness of the Creative's failing faith into CMS, and although they again left the dip sockets on the board, this time, they not only remove the Philips ICs, but also the logic, which would make it possible to switch between OPL2 and CMS sound. It was possible to buy a CMS upgrade with the two Philips SAA1099 and one logic ICs, but it didn't find a lot of interest and slowly vanished from the market. As Creative released their next generation sound card, Soundbluster Pro, there was no more CMS support on it whatsoever and this audio option eventually was put down to the history. And here we are, about 30 years later, digging in the history and trying to resurrect the technology from the dead. The old Sound Blaster with the CMS cards are rare and expensive, but from time to time you get a lucky punch to get one, especially the Sound Blaster 2.0 is still relatively easy to find. However, you barely can find one with original CMS upgrade by Creative. At least, I never saw one. For the Sound Blaster 1.0 and 1.5, it is just a matter of finding two Philips SAA 1099 ICs, which are cheap like dirt, and you can find plenty of new old stock on the internet. However, for the Sound Blaster 2.0, there was also this Logic IC, which switches between CMS and OPL2 sound. This was a gap which couldn't be filled for a very long time. As I said, original parts from Creative are very rare, if you can find them at all. At least I never saw one in real. And the knowledge about the logic has been gone. At least until October 2011, where the logic equations were dumped on Vogons. This logic could be simply written on a DIP20 programmable logic IC and used in combination with two Philips SAA1099 on a Sound Blaster 2.0 to resurrect the CMS sound. Sounds great, yes? Well, unfortunately it came out very quickly that the dumped logic equations have some bugs and are not compatible with some revisions of Sound Blaster 2.0. And yes, there were some of them. After some analysis, it became clear that the equations are only compatible with the cards with CT1336 controller IC, but not running on revisions with CT1336A. The community was trying to get behind the course with a lot of effort, but with a little success, and unfortunately, the progress stopped until the end of 2018, where a guy named Sontek suddenly reported that he was able to find the issue with the logic equations. At this point, I have to make a cut. 
I never have had a Sound Blaster with CMS option until around March of 2019, where I got one Sound Blaster 2.0 accidentally. I found these empty sockets on it and started to research what they are for. After a while I came to the told Vogons thread about the CMS logic equations and this was the beginning of the story for me. Up to that point I was always thinking that the richer community is open, that it is aimed to research and to preserve the history, and soon I was proven to be wrong. Back to the CMS logic equations. As I told, one guy reverse engineered this issue and found the errors in the CMS logic equations. However, unfortunately, he was not interested in opening it to the community, but just to sell already programmed ICs. I honestly didn't expect this and made a bad joke about reverse engineering his work. You must know, I'm a software developer since many years and if there is something evil in any engineering, then it is so-called bus factor. It means that if a knowledge of some technology lies on the shoulders of one person, the community will lose his knowledge completely if the person gets ran over by a boss. This is a placeholder for any accident. But the point is, I didn't expect to meet some people in the retro community who would like to prevent the history and technological knowledge from being preserved. I mean, I understand that people want to make money with it, but there are a lot of ways to do so without keeping the knowledge about this old technology in secret. There are many people who can't or don't want to solder to create PCBs or to program something, make the work and sell the parts to them, but let everybody know how it works, or this knowledge will one day vanish with you. Anyway, I was claimed to do piracy and that I should do the work myself. The sky is the limit. I don't understand some people, but I guess they didn't want the solution to be public because they already paid for it. Well, not everyone is the same and the community helped me a lot in the past, so I always want to give something back. Furthermore. I found this CMS topic quite interesting anyway, so I accepted the challenge and ordered a logic analyzer from China. As I told in the beginning already, this work has been done about one and a half years ago, and I didn't plan at that time to make a video about it. I didn't even have had a YouTube channel at that time yet. So for this video, I had to get into the topic again and redo some of the steps. Please pardon me if something looks like a mock, since it is one. After almost two months of waiting, the logic analyzer eventually arrived and I instantly started to analyze the problem. It took me an hour or so to learn how the logic analyzer works. By the way, it is a really nice tool. It costs you next to nothing, but helps a lot if you are in DIY electronics, like Arduino and such things. Anyway, first I tested with a multimeter all the traces to understand the raw schematics and got the datasheets of the Philips SA-1099 as well as of Yamaha YM3812 ICs. I will not describe every pin here, but briefly explain how I got it working. Take a closer look at the sound card, in particular at the sockets for the Yamaha YM3812 OPL2 synthesizer at the bottom, the two Philips SA-1099 CMS synthesizers on the top, and the GAL 16V8 programmable logic IC, which is basically responsible for switching between the related synthesizer ICs. The easiest way to start is to take a closer look at the CMS OFF jumper, which deactivates the CMS completely when set, which also was the default factory setting if the sound card was delivered without the SA-1099 and the related logic ICs. One leg of this jumper is connected to the CT1336A controller and the other goes directly to the chip select leg of the YM3812. So if the jumper is set, the signal which comes from CT1336A directly activates or deactivates OPL2 synthesizer IC by pulling the chip select signal high or low. By the way, I will talk only about the chip select signals here and they are low active. So it's kind of inverted logic. The chip is on if the signal is 0 volts and the chip is off if the signal is 5 volts. In other words, if I say that something is active, I actually mean there is 0 volts. I hope you know what I mean. Okay, the question is what happens if the jumper is not set? Obviously, the signal will never reach the YM3812, but if you follow the traces, you will see that the same signal which goes to jumper from CD1336A also goes to the one of the logic IC inputs on pin 1, as well as there is one output pin 14 of the logic IC, which goes to the pin 7 of YM3812 IC. This is already a step forward. We could now replace the jumper by a logic which would simply connect pin 1 with pin 14, and we would basically get the same behavior as we had with the jumper. However, replacing a jumper with a logic IC is quite stupid and boring, isn't it? Eventually, we want our CMS chip working. 
Therefore, there are another two signals which are going from the CT1336A controller into the logic IC, and some combination of these control signals will turn the OPL2 or CMS ICs on or off. One simple step left to do is to find out which combination is responsible for which IC. This was the point where the logic analyzer helped me to cut some corners. However, in the end, it is absolutely not necessary to use the logic analyzer here. I mean, we know which output pins of the logic IC are responsible for the chip select signal of which IC, and we only have three input signals coming in. It is already even sufficient just to make a permutation of all of the input signals, and you would get there. Anyway, at this point I thought it would be more complicated, and so I inserted the pins of my logic analyzer directly into the related socket holes. To get the signals, I just fired up Monkey Island in Adlib mode and in Game Blaster, aka CMS mode, and compared the signals. Long story short, we already know that if the signal on pin 1, here red, is active, we have to activate the Yamaha chip. That is a good start. It turned out that if also the signal on input pin 3 is active, here blue, then the first SAA1099 IC must be activated. And last but not least, if the signal on second pin, here green, is active and the signal on pin 1 is inactive, the second SAA1099 IC must be activated. And that's it. As easy as that. The up to that point publicly available code on Vogons had only one major error in the chip select part. There were also some minor issues related to the sound quality, but let's call them optional here. I still cannot believe that it took such a long time to get it working. I think it's more due to little interest in this topic and less about how complicated it was. The most time consuming thing was awaiting for the logic analyzer to be delivered. The reverse engineering itself took me just a couple of hours, including setup and learning how the logic analyzer works. I instantly opened the code on GitHub and Suntech was at least very friendly to inspect it and confirmed that the solution is more or less right. I still appreciate his help very much. And luckily, within an hour after I opened my solution, Suntech also decided to open his on Vogons, probably because the obscurity didn't make any sense anymore. And eventually, to the most interesting part, how to upgrade probably any Sound Blaster 2.0 to use it with CMS. First of all, what you will need. A pair of Philips SAA1099 ICs, one GAL 16VA generic logic array IC, a programmer like TL866, and an image file which you want to write onto the GAL. The ICs are very cheap and you can buy them on eBay, AliExpress, whatsoever. If you buy in China or any not very trustful seller, buy some more of them. Unfortunately, it is quite common that some of the ICs are sold broken. Maybe you make a mistake and break one of them, you know, we are all humans. And regarding the timings of the GAL 16v8, some people write that they need 15 nanoseconds versions, but I cannot confirm it. For me, all slower GALs like 25 nanoseconds work just as good. Anyway, the GAL image can be downloaded from my GitHub repository. I'll put the link into the description. Go to Releases and download SBCMS JAT file from the latest release. The source code is completely open and you can browse through it if you are interested in how it works. Now put one GAL 16v8 into the programmer and program it with the SBCMS JAT image which you downloaded before. This step depends very much on the programmer you are using, but for TL866, you have to select the proper GAL, model 16v8, then open the JET file and click on Program the IC. As simple as that. Now you have to put the program GAL 16v8 IC into this lower dip socket right above the Yamaha IC, and the two Philips SAA1099 ICs go into the both upper three sockets. Pay attention to the polarity or you will destroy the ICs or even your sound card. The notch on the IC must be aligned with the notch on the dip socket. Last but not least, you have to remove this jumper, which deactivates CMS mode if set. And this is the whole upgrade, simple isn't it? Well, but we have to test this yet. There are some games and music trackers which do support CMS sound option. Let's start with something simple. Paku Paku supports both Adlib and CMS. Let's test Adlib first. <laughs> Seems to work just fine. Now let's try CMS. You can select it with command line agreement CMS.
that works as well and the square wave sound of CMS is more like an old game console compared to the soft sound of Adlib. I also found that Monkey Island makes a good test object. This game supports all kinds of different sound options and they can be selected directly from the command line. Let's test Adlib first by running Monkey A. Okay, this seems to work, at least nothing is broken. Now let's try CMS. Therefore we have to start Monkey with argument G for Game Blaster. Honestly, I prefer CMS sound over Adlib in this game. Not all the games make good use of CMS, but Monkey Island plays beautifully with the stereo FM sound of CMS. For me, the mono OPL2 sound in this game is quite boring compared to CMS. I will put the full audio record of the CMS Monkey Island intro at the end of this video. Last question is, which revisions of the Sound Blaster 2.0 did I test with my code? I tested it with two revisions of Creative Sound Blaster, a 049151 with CD1336 controller and 069328 with CD1336A. The second one was which didn't work with the originally published equations on Vogons in 2011. With my code, however, I didn't have had any problems. These two revisions made by Creative were the only one I had at hand. However, to test as much as I can, I actually even found this QuickShot sound machine, which seems to be a rebranded Sound Blaster 2.0. Even the manual looks very much the same, just the cover is different. By the way, the manual is awesome, with a lot of very exciting low-level information. However, the interesting thing about this QuickShot sound card is that it had the same revision number as the Creative Sound Blaster with CT1336 controller, but was technically identical to the other one with CT1336A chip. Furthermore, this QuickShot variant didn't even have had the dip socket soldered, so I added them and tested the CMS upgrade there too. And voila, it worked just as well. With this video, I didn't only want to show you how to make a CMS upgrade for your sound card, but also to remind you all what a community means. I would like to inspire you to research the old technology and share your knowledge with all of us. All of this know-how has historical and educative value, which is higher than personal profit. And if you want to earn some money with it, do so. Produce your PCBs, solve the parts, program things for people who don't have enough skills or tools. But please, don't keep things secret. It destroys the spirit of a community. And this is it from me. I hope this video was helpful for you. I also hope that I could inspire you and give you some points to think about. Just as always, please leave your feedback below, like, dislike, subscribe, and so far, I say thank you and goodbye.